I love it. I think most of you know, um, my spiritual leader, my pastor, Pastor Gary, I love him with all my heart, and Pastor Rose, I texted him before I came into this building and said, um, sometimes I'm still overwhelmed and shocked at where my family is, and we truly would not be where we are today without his guidance and leadership and belief in, in who we are and what we can do. He's a great man of God. And um, I always want to give honor where honor is due. And um, he's a man that deserves honor. And I, I love him and I love what he's done. And Cape First is a place of uh, a place where God is doing great things. Pastor Daniel told me before, he, before I came up here, he said, a couple said that they did professional ministry and they love coming here because it's so raw. And I would agree that the raw presence of God just has saturated this place. That you haven't grabbed a hold of that religious spirit and I pray you never will. That you'll always be free to move in the things that God has for you. And so the last time I was here, we brought a, a large team with us and had a blast. Um, I... They said, what are you going to do this time? And I said, not climb a mountain. Um, I, loved, I loved when we got to the top. I hated every other minute of it. <clears throat> and so uh, I don't know what mountain we climbed, but I know that it had snow on the top and probably wasn't a great idea to climb it in shorts and a T-shirt. Seemed like a great idea from the bottom. Got great pictures. Haven't tried it. And so... Coming back this time, um, the team is back home, and they're all back from college, and we were reminiscing, and we FaceTimed them. They're leading my service, raise up a generation, and they're taking it, and so uh, called them back home. But last time when we were here, I just want to give a, a testimony and a thank you for prayer. Uh, my keyboard player that was here last time. Um, most of you uh, have probably heard this story. Before I go any further, let me introduce my beautiful wife who's sitting here on the front row. Um, I love her with all my heart. She is awesome. <clears throat> she truly is every, uh, everything to me and keeps me in check and ki kicks me and tells me and believes in me and loves me and um, does everything that I can't do, and, uh, and then some, and uh, I just love her for that. But last time we were here, um, we were, uh, my son uh, was the drummer, and uh, his girlfriend at the time was the keyboard player, and um, now they are engaged, and they have it all figured out. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm excited about this. <laughs> Uh, somebody told us the other day, in a couple of years, we could be grandparents. Yeah, that's what I said. Wow. But I want to tell you how good God is. Um, a couple months after returning home, um, Hannah, the one that played the keyboard, that uh, she lives in Arkansas, which is about a two-hour drive from our house in Missouri. Uh, she was driving up from her house to go to a concert um, with my son, and on the way up, uh, she was following a GPS, her GPS, it took her to a side road that she didn't really know where she was going, and, and she was trying to follow the GPS and the road at the same time. She missed a stop sign, and a car hit her going 60 miles an hour at least right in her door uh, on impact uh, her head went through her driver's window and uh, immediately knocked her out. Uh, she was airlifted to the hospital in our city. And um, I just want to let you know and encourage you, the generation that's coming up behind you, youth, be encouraged. Parents, grandparents that are here tonight, be encouraged that a generation is ready to take it on. And as the helicopter landed, um, 
I remember standing there with my son as tears streamed down his eyes, and he said, Dad, I don't know what's going on. And I, and I looked at him, and I said, Son, it's going to be okay. And inside, I was hoping what I was saying was correct. And as they pulled her out of the helicopter and they put her on the stretcher, they surrounded her with a couple of police so nobody could get to the gurney. And I remember standing about 10 feet away from the stretcher and could not even look at her face because it was covered in blood. And my son tried to make his way through the policemen and they said, son, you can't come any closer. And I remember him pointing at that stretcher. And as a 17-year-old boy at the time looked at that stretcher and said, Hannah, you will live and not die. I declare life into your body now. In the name of Jesus, I declare that you will live. She went in and did a, every kind of scan you could possibly do. I remember texting Pastor Daniel and saying, please pray. Please pray. I don't know what's going on. Every time the doctor came out, the report got worse. Every time he came out, it was, we have to do this. They had to drill a hole in her head because her brain was swelling so fast that they had to relieve pressure. She was out. She was in a coma. My son was overwhelmed. He was stressed out. And so we were driving around town. And as we were driving, just trying to talk about life and quoting scripture and the verse in the Bible that says, I believe, but help me with my unbelief, kept running in my head going, God, I need you right now. I know you can do it. And I remember driving down the road with my son and God audibly spoke to me and said, the number three. And I looked at Kyle and I said, God just said the number three. Of course, that wasn't what he wanted to hear. He was like, okay, and? I said, I don't know, Google it. Stud, let's just get everything you can on number three right now. I don't know. Let's just figure it out. We studied it for a while. He said, Dad, God just told me. There's no better place to be than in a car in the middle of a storm. And your son looks at you and says, God just told me. And as he looked at me, he said, God just told me that the doctors made a mistake, that she's going to be perfectly fine, and that there'll not be one broken bone in her body. I said, that's bold. I like it. I agree with you right now. I believe this. As we studied number three, late that night, God said, did I not raise my son on the third day? I said, okay. You did. Did I not say the things that he had done, you can do greater? Yeah, you did. Immediately, our whole family was fasting and praying, believing. Her parents come from a, 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 a Southern Baptist background, Sometimes we'd be praying, and they were like, <laughs> I'm like, hey, at this point, we got no other options, people. Let's go. You either join in, or we don't know what's going to happen. And as we begin to pray for her, the doctors kept coming out to destroy faith. The last report we got was, If you had a breaker box in your house where all the circuit breakers are and you reached in and you just pulled it out as hard as you could and all the wires begin to touch, that's where she's at. Her brain has hit the side of her skull and everything is short-circuiting. If she does wake up, she probably will never talk or walk. She looks so normal in the hospital bed. And I said, How, what? They said, the good thing is we ran another scan on her body and there's no broken bones. There's just a hairline fracture on her hip. As my son looks at me and goes, yeah.
And so we begin to, we begin to intercede and, and pray, and every hour seems like 10 days. It's just getting further and further. And we were in the third day, and I'm like, yes, here it comes. We were going home to go to bed. And God didn't waste time because on the third day at 3 a.m., she woke herself up, sat up in bed, and said, where's my mom? And within three months, she was walking. She was fully rehabbed. They sent her home and said, there's not another thing we can do for, for you. You're good to go. And today, she is 100% healed. I say that to encourage you, but I truly believe it was childlike faith that took over at the edge of that helicopter that day that said, Hannah, you will live and not die. And in Jesus' name, that's the generation that's ready to take over. That's the youth that was talked about this morning. Get ready. Youth, rise up. As they take the, the, the baton from the, the ones before them, run the race that God's called you to run and get ready to see what God does. Tonight I want to read to you from Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11. Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11. I came up here with a great plan for tonight. And yesterday we sat in our cabin all day as God downloaded the story that was talked about this morning into my mind. And I told my wife, I said, ah, oh, this is it. I said, we got it. And we sat here this morning and I said, oh man, really? Well, I'm glad you told me what Pastor Dan was going to preach. That's awesome. So after I got out of here, I went and prayed in the woods for a little bit longer, and God said, I told you what to preach, do it again. And so it'll be a little bit different, but I need you all. Oh, I think God is speaking clearly tonight. And so tonight, God spoke a word clearly to me, a phrase, says, he says this, and he said it to me, and so I'm going to say it to you, and the last thing I want to do is come across as somebody that's better than somebody else. And so hear my heart. I think God's calling us to a place of holiness. Amen. That God's calling us to be set apart. God said it's not what we do. It's not what you do. It's what you don't do. That was the phrase he gave me. Isaiah 55.10 says this. It says, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Father, tonight, Father, that your word would go forth. Father, that we would hear your voice tonight, Father. And in everything that we do, Father, we would honor you tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God specifically told me that tonight he would like to validate that the voice that he speaks is as equal as important as the, as the written word. The audible voice that is spoken is just as important as the written word. I love that you guys are in a place where you believe and you flow in the prophetic, where you, you believe in signs and wonders and a demonstration of God's power. My question is, if you believe in all of that, what are you doing with it? If God speaks to you, how do you respond? Because he doesn't speak just to make you feel good. He speaks so you can do something with it. And as I begin to study the book of Samuel, first and second, all day yesterday, there was three characters that blew my mind that I'd never realized before. There was a prophet named Samuel 
that was dropped off at the church. Pastor Daniel said, do not drop your kids off here. He loves you, but he has his own. And as the prophet Samuel was dropped off, he was raised by a priest named Eli. Eli was a great priest. He was a great mentor. He, judged, he was the judge of Israel for 40 years. He had a lot of good stuff going on. And one night, Samuel awoke, and he ran to the bed of Eli and said, Yes, what do you need? And he said, I didn't say anything. Go back to bed. He did this three times. Most of you know the story. And on the last time, he said, the Lord is speaking to you. The next time he says something, say, Lord, I'm here. Your servant is here. And as Samuel heard from the Lord, he began to download something about Eli. That says, I spoke to Eli and asked him to do some things. But he hasn't done it. The next morning they wake up and Eli says, Samuel, what did he say? And he said, oh, yeah. (laughs) What's for breakfast? Come on, tell me. Don't hold anything back. Tell me what God said. And I'm paraphrasing. This is 1 Samuel that I'm going over right now. Trust me, God wants to do something awesome tonight, so hear this. And in the middle of his conversation, Samuel says, okay, He says that he's asked you to do some things. He's asked you to to make some adjustments with your kids. He's asked you to do some things in life, and, and you've avoided it. And it's not what you're doing. It's what you haven't done. You're doing good things, but you haven't done what I've asked you to do. You're a priest in the church. You're doing great things. You're the judge of Israel. You're making great progress, but you haven't done the things I've called you to do. And I read a little further. And there was a guy named Saul that came around. You all know the story of Saul. He lived a great life. He was anointed at a young age. We learned about this at camp when he went to go find the donkeys. And Samuel poured oil over his head and anointed him as king of Israel. And he took over. And yes, Until the day that Samuel came with the word of the Lord and God spoke clearly and said, go defeat the army and leave nothing behind. And Saul didn't respond very well. He brought back the king. He brought back some prized possessions. He left some things out. And God said, I I, I thank you for being a great leader, but because you didn't obey what I've told you to do, Today you're stepping out of your destiny and I'm removing my hand of blessing and I'm getting ready to raise somebody else up. He understood the law. He understood the written word. He went and did good things. He conquered what he was supposed to do, but he didn't fulfill the things that God had called him to do. And then my favorite part is we move on down into the next king that comes along, and his name is David. Now, David has his issues, but we're going to start right here in the beginning. That before every time he went to battle, the story with David goes that as he's getting ready to go into ba- uh, get, become king, Saul gets jealous And pride comes in because somebody says that Saul can kill 10,000, but David can kill 100,000, and and it's a whole new world, and he gets prideful and he gets jealous. The hardest thing about pride is the ones that have it never know it. And so Saul, being a great king, thinks that he's doing what he's supposed to do, But he forgot to obey the voice of the Lord. And since then, God has removed his hand of blessing and placed it over King David and said, let's go. David goes to hide out. And while he's hiding out, because he is honoring the voice of the Lord, God begins to add to his army. 
He starts with 30 people, mostly family. His dad joins him, his brothers join him, and a couple friends. And every time he's supposed to go to battle with a different, against a different army, every time he goes and seeks the voice of the Lord. And he says, before we go, let me ask God. As he speaks to God, God either says yes or no. And in the middle of him asking God, his army multiplies. And by the time he gets to become king of Israel, he's at about 600 people. Because he's obeyed the voice of the Lord. God is asking us tonight. There's some people here that you come to church, you do the right thing. You live a pretty godly life, but God has told you things in the night. You've had prophecies, you've been to prophetic conferences, and God has given you the audible voice, and he's waiting on you to take the step into your destiny. It's so easy to justify and compromise and wait on the things of the Lord and say, but in my Bible it says, and God says, you're right, it does, but I told you. Tonight, God is telling you, are you ready? I believe tonight God's going to speak to so many of you that you won't be able to deny the voice of where he's calling you. It is time that we take things that are common. Some of us take prophecy now as a common feel-good thing. That Pastor Daniel will come to you on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night or a Sunday night service and say, stand up, God says this. <sighs> Thank you, brother. And a year from now, you go, God, what do you want me to do? I told you a year ago what I wanted you to do. And I spoke through my prophet, but you didn't listen. You did what Eli did. You know what Eli? You know what happened to Eli? His sons and his army died in battle, and he fell off a, a bench, and he broke his neck, and he died. I don't want to speak things over you. I'm just helping you understand tonight that God is calling you to a place that he's ready to speak to this generation. He's ready to speak to you tonight. But he's ready for us to take the things that are common and make it holy again. I don't know if I've ever heard it called the God box. I like that. But David's first assignment was to go get was to go get the ark that represents everything God is, the presence of God. His first assignment was to go get it. I got to get it and I've got to get it to to Zion. I've got to get it to the place where I build the temple, where we can have crazy worship all the time. And he gets to a place where he decides that, and he knows the spoken word of God, he knows the written word of God, that it's supposed to be transported on poles with the Levites leading it into the city. He knows this. But do you know what he does? He builds a new cart. He gets some big wheels and some new boards. And ever since then, the church has been trying to usher in the presence the same way with big wheels and new boards, and it won't work. So I get to go home after this. I hope. Hear me. I see such crazy passion for Jesus in this church. I see people that want to see a move of the Holy Spirit. I see a church that wants to see their city changed. And I'm here to tell you today that God is speaking. And when he, when he speaks, we have to listen. And when we listen, we have to do. Because if we do it, we'll do the right thing. And God will bless it. And not how David's army grew, so will this church. It was multiplied every time after a victory until he became king of all of Israel. 
as David transported it on the cart. I don't really know how to say his name. I think it's Uzzah, 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 Uzzah. It's weird names. Hey, you. <laughs> anyway. Can I tell you what happened? As he's trying to honor the things of the Lord and it goes down the road and the, the cart begins to tip and he puts his hands out to hold it steady. Do you know what he did at that moment? He treated the presence of God as common and said, I got it. I can hold it up. And God said, no, you can't. You will not treat me as uncommon. This is a holy place, and you will treat it as such. And he destroyed him. And as they parked it in Obadiah's house for three months, David looked and goes, whoa, he's being blessed. It's time to move that thing. It's time to make it happen, but first... I need to go back to what God said. I need to go back to what God said so I can fulfill the blessings and the destiny of my life. Where do you need to go back to today? Where do you need to go back to to where God spoke that word? That you might have said, eh, I don't know if that was God. Oh, God, really? You want me to help out in the nursery? <laughs> you wouldn't call me to the nursery. I'm so talented. I mean, those are for the other people. I can't do anything, not me. Wait, God, you've called me to tithe everything I have? You've called me to drain my bank account? God, now God, you know how I roll. I always give you my 10%. And I always give a little extra when I can. Where did God tell you? Where did God say it? Maybe you were at home at your darkest moment. Maybe you were in church in the middle of a prophetic conference. Maybe you were singing during worship and you heard it. And you said, wow, I heard that. Some people wonder what the voice of God sounds like. Can I tell you that Samuel got confused many times because he thought it was Eli? Can I tell you that sometimes the voice of God sounds like your spiritual authority? So if you hear somebody, you hear somebody whistling and yelling, it could be God. God's here to set free, to heal. I truly believe that God wants to heal some people tonight. At youth camp, it wasn't part of the testimonies, but we had physical healings that took place. And let me just tell you that, that, that the youth age is pretty honest. I mean, they're pretty honest. If you're like, they're like, hey, you know, my knee's hurting, and you pray over it, and you're like, feel better? And you're like, no. It still hurts. It's actually hurting worse now. Okay. We'll pray harder. They tell you how it is every time. They don't have all the fluff. They haven't been around it long enough to know that they got to twiddle their fingers and shake their leg and go, oh, God, right? Yes, hallelujah. They just go, show it to me. Just like the one girl said this morning. Prove it, God. I want more. I want to go to the next level. Now prove it. Come on. I'm ready. Do it. Where were you at? I'm known for losing the car keys and my wallet on a regular basis. I don't lose them. I just can't remember where I put them last. There's a difference. I know it's not like gone. I know it's not like, I'm like, it's in like eight different spots. I've just got to find it. (laughs) 
And my wife will look at me and I'll be like, or my, you know, luckily this, this thing is a miracle because it's got a little ding, 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 ding. I can find my phone. It's great. Hallelujah. But sometimes I'll set the car keys down and she'll say, oh, hey, I said, did you take the keys? No. You had them last. Oh, yeah, I did. Let me just think for a minute. And you know what I have to do? I have to begin to retrace every step that I took. And I go, okay. I went to the refrigerator. I went back to the refrigerator. <laughs> Turned around, went back again. Stood there with it opened. Went to the couch. Went into the bedroom. I trace it all the way around my house until I go, oh yeah, all the places that I've been, here they are. Can I ask you something? Where did God speak to you last? Where did you set the word down? Because tonight, I want you to pick it back up. Just as David parked the ark and he had to go back and pick it up, I want you to pick up where you left off with God tonight. Some of you have been walking in a place that you go, it is so dry here. I just, I don't know what's going on in my life. I haven't heard. I can't see. I have no vision. I have no purpose. I love coming to church and God's saying, I spoke. Remember what I said. And some of you just need a fresh touch from God tonight. 